Yes. Ready? I'd like to call this meeting of the Ledger Town Council to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roxanne, would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Davis? Here. Mr. Dombrowski? Here. Mrs. Ingalls? Here. Mr. Malone? Here. Mr. Marshall? Here. Mrs. McGratton? Here. Mr. Sebelia? Here. Mr. Soms? Here. Mr. Washington? Here. Nine here, zero absent. Okay, first we will start with our town engineer, Steve Maslin, who is going to give us a pavement management update that we receive once a year, right, Steve? About once a well, year? Well, no, I, not once a year, probably every other year on average. But really? Maybe every three years. Actually. No. Because <laughs> I get the road rating every month. I was going to say, because I yeah. cite your reports all the time. Well, it's, 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 the reason for this timing is we're due for a comprehensive reinspection. Okay. So we're, it's every three years for that. And it also is uh, about five, six years after the completion of the bond <coughs> for roads, so we want to see how we're protecting our investment, right. so we'll see that. So um, this is just a, a review of the standard curve, and it underlies the philosophy we've adopted over the last several years to implement some preventative measures as opposed to structural, you know, worst first type approach. So you see, without dwelling on this too long, because you've seen this before, there's a 40% drop of in quality uh, over an extended period of time. I picked a curve that's more representative of what we're seeing here. About 15 years, you lose 40% of the quality, maybe a little bit more. But you see the curve, at the, the little um, preservation curve that overlaid on that, where if you apply preservation techniques, you will keep the rating for an extended period of time higher, as opposed to letting it go, and then you're down into the fair to poor or worse category where you're having to implement structural methods. And so you spend a lot less earlier to save a lot later. And we've seen that now over several years, we're, we're seeing that. Uh, this you're not going to be able to really make out, but this is a map that, because we, we kept track of our spending on every road since 97, since I started, I was able to get the company that does this beta to put the history in, and now we have a map, since 97 anyway, of dollars per square mile spent on every road. So you see on a color code basis, first of all, that most roads are receiving something. Uh, of course, some more than others, and that's why you have the different colors. Uh, I'm working with Regina to get some of our beta maps onto our GIS so that we can include this map and other maps for the public to see, and, or you can direct them to and say, just go to our GIS, you'll see various maps. Uh, you can find out some things about your road. This would be one of them. But this just shows historically uh, that we are spending everywhere and we're spending appropriately as we can for the conditions and keeping our roads up. This shows over the last four years numerically how that's been the case. Uh, crack sealing is the least cost measure, but I would say that is the most important measure you can implement in stretching your road a uh, lifespan if you get it early enough. So you see 65 miles. Uh, we have 110 miles in town. That's almost no overlap there. So we have treated, I'd say, out of that 60 are unique road miles out of our 110. More than half of our roads have been crack sealed and that makes sense because I have them on an every five year cycle and then I look at them to see if we have to delay it or increase it or, or whatever, but that's what you're seeing. Then microsurfacing we've implemented. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as the next level of preservation technique. And then, over, and that, so those are the preservation techniques and then you see structurally the overlay, the level of microsurface, which is something I uh, implemented on uh, more recently. Mill and overlay reconstruction, miscellaneous is some things we've done to stretch road life uh, in partial ways around town. But you see the dollars spent shows that we're balancing it. Uh, we're, we're still putting more in the structural side, which may always be the case, but you see we're putting, we put up over a million dollars in the last four years into preservation. Um, as well. So uh, 
Two and a half million dollars has been spent over the last four years uh, covering 87 miles of road. Uh, next, this is though, however, the bad news. Uh, in back in 2016, we had a peak road average road surface rating of 83 plus. And that was after we had completed the spending of the, I would say, injection of funding by virtue of bond to bring our roads up. Well, we're not spending at the level of we need annually to maintain that. It, 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 the, the thumb rules have proven correct. You need about a million dollars a year to maintain your average road rating. So we've seen, because we haven't maintained that, the actual average has been 633000 a year. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that. Um, and we still have a present balance that was unspent of 440000 because the weather didn't support our plan last year. So as you see the decline, we went from 83.2, we're down to 81.6. Now that's program, that's what the program automatically tells you after three years, we don't have actually eyes on the ground. It'll be reset this year when we actually have people come in. I'm hoping that the rating has done better than what the program says because we're trying to do things to stretch dollars in various ways and, and put real, and put that into measures that are actually preserving quality as well. But we're down to 81.6. Part of that has to do with we, we didn't finish our program last year. So I would say if we had, we wouldn't have dropped so much, at least uh, between 2018 and 2019. We're ready to jump on things uh, because we have funding. We'll get going as early as possible this year in April. I'll show you where we're headed. Uh, this is just a summary. 81.6 <laughs> has still a good, good rating, probably uh, one of the top in the region. Uh, still, our, our arterial and collector roads are at 86, and of course we want to keep those at least on the high level for the traffic volume. Uh, we have a present backlog of 7.1 million, and now that is a fictional number really. It's um, the number that theoretically would bring all your roads from where they're at to 100, to 100, and you never get there, so you're never going to, I'm not here to ask you for $7 million, I'll just put it that way. I wouldn't be able to spend it fast enough to get there anyway. But um, So our projected average road r surface rating, one way or another, is still going to be above 80 after this next calendar year. Uh, again, annual funding to maintain road surface ratings, about a million. And this is, shows where we're headed from now. Uh, 81.6 at a million, you can stay there. Uh, otherwise, at other levels of funding that are shown there, it shows where we're projected to go out five years. So if, if we were at the low end, you'd, we'd end up dropping below 80, theoretically, uh, if, if we're looking at $600,000 of annual funding over that period of time. Uh, we don't have to dwell on that. Okay, now here's the trends just in a bar chart. You see where we just declined. You know, it's, it's very almost unnoticeable when you look at the chart the way it is, so I put the number in there. But we don't know where we're headed, but each year you see what was spent at the bottom. And, and there's various reasons why, uh, like say for instance 2016 was not even a half a million dollars. But you see still that we're well under a million dollars. Um, that's the theoretical number to maintain the average rating. Where, where, where are we going in 2020? Well there's a few factors involved in that. Because we've tethered our road program to state funding so heavily, we're always wondering not only when we're going to get the money. We haven't had TAR money come in. I've never seen it this late. Not one <coughs> increment of that money has come in yet. Not even no, no portion of it that you get in July or August at, at the start of the fiscal year. But what, are the, what about the other grants that we've tethered our road program to? You know, we don't know if or when. So. That has had some perturbations in where we've been. We've thankfully we got one of the big loan, uh, big grants that we weren't thinking we were going to get. It did come in a couple of years back, but there's that. Okay, this is where we're headed this year. Uh, if the funding comes in as <coughs> programmed and as expected, including funding that was held over, you see that the Christie Hill and the uh, Sherwood Forest neighborhoods are going to be fully resurfaced. Uh, and then there's a few miscellaneous roads there. There's the Ash Drive, Amber Court, and then Fairway and Colby. So those are the ones, and I'll show you where they show up on the road rating list so you see that it makes sense 
if you were to drive them, you would say, oh, that makes sense. I mean, it, it would match the, the, the eye test. The, the uh, microsurfacing, we've got uh, Shoeville North, and then if funding permits, Mike Military Highway and Haley Road. And then crack ceiling you see variously all over the town, which is just the way it shakes <coughs> out year to year. Quite a bit of that wherever the five-year window pulls up for that year. And there may be a few more roads that I put in there as I look more closely at them before we get started. Uh, and here's the uh, tabular list. You still probably can't read that very well. The highlighted yellow ones are uh, roads are all the roads that are in within the scope of the the, uh, the resurfacing effort. So this is this is pavement. This is not crack ceiling. This is not microsurfacing. This is actual roads that are going to get paved. And and this is the one page one of seven of our road inventory and it, it starts with the worst road rating so this these are the worst rated roads in town starting with the worst first and you see obviously our program is targeted at a high percentage of those and and why why don't we just start at one and go down and go as far as we can well you do it by neighborhood it would make no sense to do the worst road if you've got one you know, you got to do it by neighborhood, and that's just the way it shakes out. But I would say on the on the uh, positive side, out of seven pages, we only have, which would be what 14 columns of rows or so. We only have uh, s one column of rows that are in, in 50 or less, actually 60 or less, rated. So most of our roads in town are. Uh, uh, beyond this page, they're almost 70 and up. So we've made a lot of, uh, you know, progress uh, with this program, and I think we're still poised to be in a good position. Now, one of the problems we've faced, as you've noticed, and I'm going to pop this next slide up and say I know exactly where that is. Uh, seven years ago, we we implemented microsurfacing. Se uh, microsurfacing is advertised as a seven-year treatment. Uh, I think for the most part we're going to get the ba our bang for the buck. In fact, uh, there are some roads we won't even have to, that have been microsurfaced from seven years ago that we're not going to touch yet. But there are some that are falling apart. <laughs> not, at least they're delaminating. It's not like you hit them and they're a pothole. Now, now you probably recognize the, the up, upper right corner of that that you see there, that's Whalehead Road. You know that stretch I'm talking about. You come off of 214, you drive through that stretch, hit Sandy Hollow. We're also seeing delamination variously in other places. Well, we were thinking, well, I've been talking to people, what do we do? Because you can't put asphalt in there. It's too, too thin of a layer, it's not gonna stay. Some you can if it's thick enough, but most times you can't. So we came across a new treatment, Mastic. Mike's probably familiar with it at some level. This is something that I think has been tried and true in other places. But it handles the, the, this type of thing, the, uh, the delamination problem. We demoed it up at the top of the hill at the transfer station. So if you drive up and take a left, you'll be driving over three patches that, that, is, that is this material. And that was just done uh, like three weeks ago. So it's kind of right under our nose. We can watch what happens. Uh, it's doing great so far. <coughs> Certainly a thousand times better than cold patch. Uh, so we are optimistic. We're already got plans to uh, rent a machine for a month and, and, and do this wherever we need to to stretch the, these roads like Whalehead where otherwise other sections are still fine and we don't need to, to do anything with maybe crack seal, I'll be looking at that. But So this was, has been the one piece of the puzzle that I've needed to get uh, taken care of and we're implementing things in house now that we haven't before. You've probably seen the, the spot milling with our skid steer where we will take areas that really need structural work, we'll mill it out and, and we will patch it ourselves. And uh, Lantern Hill Road is a good example of where that's been done. That, of course, I know that's out of the way for most people, but there are other places that's been done. We have our own crack sealer, so we don't get out and do it in a huge scope of work way that the contractor does, but we can go out and when we go and do patches ourselves, like these uh, mill and fill patches, we can crack seal them and, and you don't get the raveling there. So that is the presentation. I don't know if I left enough time for comments. Sure. But, um, um, any I have a, two quick questions. Yeah. Sorry to jump in. Uh, one is, 
as far as the microservicing, is that are the failures in the microservicing really located around areas with high turning radiuses versus uh, straightaway sections, or is it just all it's over the place? It's random. Random. Uh, it's the, where it failed more quickly than in other places, we think it was a moisture problem. At, like on Whalehead, there might have been a moisture thing. Uh, in other places, I think you get various things that get it started, maybe a plow contact, and then once that happens, once you open it up and the plow yes. hits it, it's just going to go further. Uh, and this just wears off, too, with plow contact. You can go past places. If you go past uh, Avery Hill Extension, where you're getting to that slope there, you see where the original pavement is showing up. And it's just, sha the, the plow just slowly shaves this off. And, and it it's, doesn't leave any edge, but it, it leaves a the, you know, distinct color contrast there. And the other thing was on getting the uh, j uh, joint, se the crack sealer, smart move. That's because... Just like you're saying, a lot of these patches, if you get, keep water away from the edges, yeah. you get a lot more life out of it. And that material is uh, it's a very good product. Yeah, it, I'm optimistic. We get a great year for curb damage so far, <laughs> like <laughs> zero. When that happens, we get started with other things right away. And uh, this will be one of the things we get started with. So. Tom, you had a question. I, I do. Uh, first thing I want to say is, Steve, you guys are doing a great job uh, maintaining the roads. Uh, I had a, um, you guys did uh, right there on Fairview that where that little stream comes in, uh, you guys made a structural repair, it failed due to flooding, and it started to sink down, and within a week or two, you had the contractor back, I'm, I'm sure it was guaranteed work. Well, that was, no, that was not the same work. We tried to do it ourselves and found out the pipe was failing, it was one of those corrugated metal pipes that was failing. Yeah. We found a process where you can line it now. and. Yeah. and I'll be coming to you for, for some for a, so, a nutmeg so, road soon. So the, about the, that the next question I have, uh, really, uh, well, the question I really have is, so when you have a, an emerging <coughs> catastrophic failure uh, due to flooding or fr frost or an accident or plow, is that calculated into the road rating, one, and two, how do we pay for that? Does it come out of the road money? No, well... It all depends, because if it comes up as an emergency, that's one of the options. But we, I'd have to approach the mayor and the council to see if they want to pay for it separately and not impact the routine road work. And it doesn't affect the road rating. It's such a sm probably so it's small section. So it's independent. It's, not right. it's independent. Okay. That. But, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I would say also that the dollars that are set aside for road work in terms of achieving a level rating, the million dollars a year, is, does not include drainage work and other things that this is just yeah. road surface Catch basins all work, yeah which is always part of what we end up doing also i i really think we're actually stretching our dollar better but i'll know more after this year's inspection and after doing some of this uh, mastic repair and stuff <coughs> like that just as a, a comment about your corrugated pipe failure or <coughs> imminent fa failure is coming just give an idea of the impact if anybody remembers route 32 in norris was shut down and it's a corrugated pipe that was going into failure. We got there too late, and that's why we had to dig the road up. DOT mm -hmm. dug the road up because of that. Yeah. I, I'm going to be looking at this more proactively uh, because we've got this in some places. Around the corner from Fairview, you've got Nutmeg. The Pine Brook comes right mm -hmm. through there, too. It's, just, it's a corrugated pipe. So we're looking to repair that this year before we face anything uh, like that. But there's other places in town that we're going to have to look for those pipes. So Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. sure. um, Always interesting. And also, I should add, thank you so much for your quick response when I send you social media questions. <laughs> well, wait till next Monday when we start collecting those extra carts. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the warning. So I have a question while we're waiting. How's our winter operations budget? I found other places to spend it. <laughs> I was hoping to spend it on the roads. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I didn't to get out of here without oh, anything. Obviously, it's not bad at this point. Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we had some other problems. <laughs> and there he goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they answered your question, though.
So now we'll have a presentation from our Board of Education for their fiscal year 2020-21 budget. Good evening. So a little, a little change in uh, our presentation tonight. Mr. Rahner was going to grace you with his presence, and uh, unfortunately he's sick. Hopefully not the flu, but uh, we had to make a little change. So the superintendent's going to pitch it for uh, uh, this evening to go through the budget. But um, I thought we would just kick us off. Um, ironically, it's it's four years of going through the budget cycle for me being on the board, which ironically for the superintendent also coincided to when he joined our district. So there's no coincidence there by any means. Um, I know I've mentioned this through other bu budget cycles in the past. I continue to appreciate the partnership with uh, Town Council Finance and, and the budget uh, sessions that we've had, as well as the partnership with Town Council as we've gone through this process. Um, hopefully, I think as many of, you, of the members have seen, we've, we've drastically changed our approach and how we've um, approached the budget overall over the last uh, four years. Um, the process has remained the same over the last four years. Really, we, we started with the superintendent working with the administration to present their budget. Um, the focus has always been around the board's adopted strategic plan. So this is not, tell me everything you want, let's make sure that the budget request aligns to what the, strate the strategic plan, plan is, and then ultimately making sure that we're ensuring the same pro uh, programs that we offer our students within the district and uh, certainly meet the enrollment needs from the district overall. Um, so uh, the board went through this, the very similar process where this was presented to uh, the finance committee, uh, multiple sessions going through board finance, uh, before it was ultimately presented to the broader Board of Education. We also had on February 5th, we had a, um, not to use the term a hearing, but we had obviously an open session for the public to come in. Uh, unfortunately, as in the past, we haven't had much public involvement with our budget cycle, so, um, but we continue to make sure that all the budget documents that we have are posted online, including the presentation. Uh, we've also maintained a, a comprehensive FAQ out there, um, so as we've received questions throughout the budget cycle, uh, both by members as well as uh, community members, we posted those out online too, uh, to, to uh, uh, obviously ensure transparency. So what we'll do tonight is uh, the superintendent will go through um, the original presentation he shared with the uh, Board of Education. I will uh, make note of the fact that the board ultimately adopted the proposed budget with no uh, alter alterations to that proposed budget. Again, it fully aligns to our strategic plan and uh, the broader needs of the district. So I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Hartman. Thank you very much. So if we do this well, uh, as we do with our FAQ, we try to anticipate questions that come. I know uh, Councilwoman Davis always wants to know how many people were budgeting for retirement. So, so I'm figuring this out after a little bit. Um, but I can't uh, overemphasize the importance of our strategic plan and where we're uh, ultimately going uh, in Ledger Public Schools. And that's uh, making sure that each one of our students uh, reach their unlimited potential. And there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and truly thank the board and council for continuing to support that. Um, this year we approached our process as an administrative team a little bit different. Um, we developed a uh, comprehensive list uh, of uh, requests from each school building uh, and each director uh, and categorized that into things that felt we could include in the budget that we were strategically ready to implement. Um, things that we think are um, in need of significant consideration. You'll see the top one on that list is the potential for an additional K-5 teacher depending on enrollment um, swings uh, and then other pieces. And then there was a red zone uh, made up of a, a series of things that we talked about through the budget process but we weren't ready to implement or it wasn't the right time. Um, again, just trying to keep our, um, our eye on the fact that, uh, that uh, resources are, are very limited. It was working, no, it's not working. There it working. goes, there it goes. There, oh, oh. Uh, all right, it's a little delay. All right. So as we look at the budget breakdown, fairly typical for a district our size, to see salaries and wages, 71%. Um, so any kind of movements we make, I mean, it's typically <laughs> going to be in the, in the salary line. We did take some, you know, savings with utilities based on solar. Um, that was pretty limited. I know in some conversations with council member Psalms, we weren't seeing any, you know, that big of savings coming out of the solar projects uh, on the other sites yet. And so we took a modest savings on that, uh, about $40,000. And we continue to look at every line individually each year um, and look for ways to, to shave costs, if you will. Um, and that helps to minimize the overall <coughs> impact. I just want to point out on this, the insurance and benefits side, um, you'll see a 2.5% uh, 2 that does not include health care. Um, health care, we're part of the partnership that's um, carried on the town side of the budget um, from the days when we were self-insured. So that is not included in that 2.5%, but that is 
uh, other insurances and things like that for um, our employees. Feel free to stop me anytime. One important piece that I think that the town council ha uh, have a picture is just where we are from an expenditure standpoint related to the state. Um, and I, I know, uh, Council Member Soms, you've engaged in some people having conversations about per pupil. That per pupil is actually, in fact, inclusive of all spending that the Town of Ledger does Thank you. on each and every one of its students. So when uh, the mayor says they gave us so much in in-kind services for uh, the town finance director, that also is included in that per pupil number. Our insurance spend, every possible expenditure uh, is included in that per pupil allocation. So I know there was a little question about that, that it might have been a made up number. Yeah. It's a very detailed process that we go through and we do get audited every year uh, and validate that number for the state. So this is um, the numbers turned in. Uh, and you can see that the state continues to, to, <coughs> to increase its per pupil funding. Uh, we as a district have continued to, or have declined and kind of leveled out. Um, I think it's helpful to get a picture of our region. Uh, and again, I, I am very much aware that it's not an apples to uh, apples comparison, but Ledger is the uh, spends the least amount uh, uh, per pupil of any district in uh, our region. Uh, probably the most comparable would be a Montville. Uh, if we were funded at their per pupil level, we have about uh, almost 60 more staff members serving uh, our students uh, in the district for a comparable population. So, gives you a picture of of how efficiently we're spending our resources, but how tight we also are as a district in, in trying to move things forward, very focused on our strategic plan. Our funding sources, um, town appropriations about 56%. Uh, this is based on the Board of Education's revenue projections. Um, the biggest, uh, I think, story in revenue has been impact aid. Uh, we've grown that from about 500,000 when I arrived here to uh, this year's projected is about 1.8 million. Uh, so that's new revenue uh, to the town of Ledger that hopefully uh, is able to offset some of the increases that we see each and every year. Uh, education cost sharing, the state allocation, we're in the second year of a biennium this year. Uh, that number's coming in significantly higher than what was budgeted in revenue as well. So just a little chart, and I, I didn't mean to give you an eye test this evening, but this is in the budget as well. Uh, you can see where we drew some of these numbers. Uh, I don't think my laser is going to work on the screen, but um, impact aid is that first one. You can see that growth over the last several years. Uh, this year, for example, in Munis, we have 700,000 booked. Um, what we proposed uh, for next year is 1.3, which is a conservative estimate based on uh, federal funding. Uh, we're seeing about a 10% increase in that, so it'll, it'll shoot much higher than that. Uh, AgriScience operating, we've been uh, spot on with regards to what our projection is. Uh, education <laughs> cost sharing, um, this year we're budgeted in, the, in Munis at $10.4 million uh, and we'll receive about 11.6. Uh, next year's estimate, and again we only have uh, eyes on the governor's proposed budget right now, the estimate that the Board of Education put forward is um, the governor was giving us about 1.2 or about 120,000 more. Um, so we, we hope to give you estimates that are very um, respectable and that you can budget from. Uh, without any huge swings. So um, you can see kind of the revenue projections this year. The town has budgeted 11.6 <laughs> in revenue. We're estimating, um, the Board of Education is estimating, if you will, that it'll be 13.3 million in revenues uh, related to the education programs. And then our tuitions, uh, that is uh, an estimate each and every year. We were within one student this year, so uh, we have that um, pretty tight. Questions on revenue? Okay, I'm anticipating them all. <laughs> so actual and forecasted enrollment. So one of the things that, to be completely fair, one of the things that uh, has happened, because the town council and the board have increased the board of education's budget each and every year, um, but we continue to see our position in the state as far as funding fall. When I got here, I think we were 123rd in funding in the state. Um, this budget has us at 156, or last year I should say we were at 156. <coughs> When the audited numbers come back, we'll probably move to around 161 uh, in the state out of 166 districts. Um, the big part of that story is not only have we grown less than everyone else as far as our funding stream, but we've also had an increase in students. And so that, of course, when you divide it by the number of students, has impacted our pupil, per pupil funding rate. So I don't want to 
you know, um, try to do any nefarious gains that you haven't passed increased budgets, but that's gone against the larger number of students. The projections going forward have us growing about 6% over the next five, six years. Um, and it's been very difficult to project, as you can imagine. It is very sporadic. And the story I kept on sharing with the, the Board of Education last year was the third grade phenomenon we had. <coughs> we had almost 24 students enroll in third grade at Gills Ferry School. Um, it literally was a running joke. My family would come into the board office, I'd go out to introduce myself, and I'd just say, third grader? And they'd say yes. <laughs> the statistics were there for us all year long, but it's very difficult to project class sizes um, and manage the, the enrollment with some of those uh, fluctuating pieces, which is also why, if we go back to that third slide, um, the danger of having to add a class is, is there. It's a little easier now to manage with two schools than it was with, uh, with three elementary schools, but that's still uh, a constant uh, challenge point for us. Um, we project enrollment. 90% of the projection happens at the K level, and so we're looking at birth rates five years out, um, and ledger is actually separated, so typically you'll see the coral, uh, a strong correlation between the birth rate of a particular year and then that enrolling, uh, enrolling kindergarten class. Ledger's disconnected from that the last few years, so we're trying to you know, read the tea leaves as best we can, and that's just based on move-ins and move-outs and things like that. Um, we have seen a lot of housing term, um, those realtors know that, so some of our neighborhoods are starting to turn over as well, and that brings in school-aged children and, and can present some um, increased uh, <coughs> fluctuation in the So here's where we're projecting for next year relative to class size. Um, and I just um, also want to note that we actively should be having class sizes or other uh, infusions of funding into the Gallup Hill School as a Title I school. Uh, and so we receive federal funding to support that as a Title I school, and therefore you should see a difference in funding into those two schools, and we work very hard to make sure that we're allocating staff based on the needs of the school. Um, we do things based on an equitable distribution, not everyone gets the same. Right? So if I have more students who need intervention, I want to make sure more intervention resources are at that particular school, uh, and we'll continue to monitor that <coughs> and as it goes. So those are our projected class sizes, and those can fluctuate pretty you know, by two or three students on any given. What, what's your goal for class size? So the contract is the only place in which class size is discussed, uh, the teacher contract. Um, I would like to see our, our K, K2 class levels below 21. Um, and, uh, and, you know, lower if possible, but the reality is, is you're talking about uh, several hundred thousand dollar investment to get it below that level um, because it cascades up. Uh, once we get 3-5, um, you know, between 23 and 25 uh, is generally where we really like to see it. But we've had classes in the last few years that have spiked to 29. Uh, but splitting those classes in the middle of the year, there are a whole bunch of factors that go into that um, as we look to address it. Did that answer your yep. question? Thank you. <coughs> so, oh, go ahead. I'd like to go back to um, <coughs> the thing you said about the Gallup Hill School. Um, what makes it different than uh, so the percentage of students uh, in poverty as measured by free and reduced so it's lunch. an economic yeah. okay yeah so the free and reduced lunch numbers are, are, are the major <clears throat> indicator but when we look at school readiness all of those factors um, there's a significant um, need um, for us to differentiate for our Gallup and you get more federal impact aid for that no we get federal title one funds Mm -hmm. So Title I is a funding mechanism that the federal government used to um, help support education programs in uh, higher poverty schools. So we got a Title I grant that we utilize. Um, About how much is that? I want to say it's 270000 in that in that zone. It's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. But we are um, obligated, and as we should, um, apply those funds equitably to serve the students. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So key changes, trying to go through my list, I put Councilman Davis at the first. Um, <laughs> savings related to an estimated five teacher retirements and you know, make this very clear again, five teachers retire and we plan on replacing those teachers. That's an estimate, I only have two right now. Um, so I get a little nervous every year trying to read the tea leaves. Um, but um, taking those retirement savings is very important to delivering a, a, a more accurate budget. 
Uh, we did add two FTE math interventionists, um, and this is part of our strategic plan. Uh, one at Gales Ferry, one at uh, Gales Ferry Juliet on campus, and one at Mount Hill School. Uh, added one FTE health teacher at Ledger Middle School. This year has been very tight. Uh, the staff has done a great job uh, managing the significant change at the middle school. Uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, we opened up a new school, added a grade level. Um, we did some staff projections. It is very tight. Um, in particular discipline areas and you know we'll see the unified arts as they call them at the middle school driving the schedule in a way that, that it should um, because of staffing and so um, we've worked very closely with the union um, to come through solutions that band-aided us through this year with regards to our gym and health classes um, and this addition will allow us to um, implement a health program that's much needed um, for our middle age um, students. We added one FTE special education teacher uh, in the high needs program at Gallup Hill School. One of the things that uh, our team has been working very hard at is developing a continuum of services uh, from pre-K when a child joins us at, in, at three to 21. And so we've done a lot of innovative pieces with that, but one of the important uh, notes is really creating firm programming around high needs um, and social emotional. Uh, for our students at the elementary tier so that we can intervene quickly um, but also because of our limited resources I, I need to be able to focus in professional learning to those staff that are working with those students in the highest needs um, I can't kind of uh, take a very shotgun approach I have to be very very strategic about how we spend our dollars how we train staff and how we support our students um, we just don't have the luxury of staff to, um, to approach in any other way so we've been very deliberate about how we um, how we're approaching literacy as a district um, because we have to be very targeted because we have a very minute um, professional learning budget and I can't afford to do 50 things halfway. I have to be very focused and do one or two things really great um, for our students. Uh, change from a part-time English language tutor <coughs> to a full-time uh, teacher position. Uh, this will be partially shared out of our Title I grant. Um, so we've gone from about seven to eight students any given year uh, who are classified as English language learners to over 30. Um, and so those 30 English language learners require a level of support that we just can't meet with a part-time tutor anymore. Um, and we can continue to see the profile of the student body change, um, whether it be from, you know, we're almost at 30% free and reduced lunch as a district. Um, and it was, I think, 18 when I got here. So if you think about that change over the last many years, um, and that's something we're continuing to see. Um, I don't want to draw a parallel to the Yale all students, but um, we do have a large, uh, a growing population for a small district of students who require that additional support. Um, and then uh, the last three, uh, and uh, this isn't everything we're doing, obviously, as a district, I tried to catch the, the larger piece. Um, so we're continuing the foundational literacy skills training. It's a program called Foundations from Wilson. Um, and so as we put that in place three years ago, I want to continue the professional learning and make sure we don't lose that. Excuse me, we've made a significant investment in literacy development. We don't want to lose sight of that and continue to build in the professional learning piece. Um, we added uh, the literacy paraprofessional. This thing is quirky. I think I needed a clicker. Um, I'm going to add that at my last Yeah, one. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> this thing's followed me around for many years. So um, We added the literacy paraprofessional back to Gales Ferry based on need profiles. Um, we had eliminated those positions uh, in last year's budget. We need to add that back in. The principal is very adamant that that, that support is needed. And then lastly, um, we made some adjustments to para um, hours. In those, in those specialized programs we've talked about, so it's matching more with students, and we're minimizing transitions between paraprofessionals in those particular programs. So the total budget request, um, 33 million 20 that represents a 1.97 increase um, for about $640,000. And how much of that is contractual? About 70 some percent, 70, at least 70. Oh, this, a, a significant portion of this is contractual. So our total contractual increases are around 500,000, <coughs> okay. plus or minus. Um, the big moves that the board has continued to um, have, and it's more seen on the town side, is with premium cost share on the health insurance plans. Our teachers have been very 
um, supportive of increasing that premium, that premium cost share and then save the town in this next budget, I think about $120,000 on yeah. that health care piece. Um, so there's definitely um, work happening there as well. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you have done a good job um, with the residency falsification cases, which I'm sure is terrible to have to do. But you, but the district just removed 39 students. That's what I saw in your last report. Can you just talk about that, about and, and how it relates to enrollment? So um, we have had an active program with regards to residency residency verification and, uh, and and making sure that the citizens of of Ledger are paying for citizens of Ledger to attend schools. Um, it is incredibly difficult. Um, Fortunately, um, people who are sneaking their children into our systems <coughs> lie really well and do all sorts of things to manipulate. Uh, and so we, we have a part-time investigator um, who, uh, who has been working for us that, that I utilize when I have cases that are brought to our attention. Um, and we work through those uh, on a regular basis. And I think, the, I think it's been about 40 students that we've removed in the last um, three years uh, for falsification. And there's a lot of misnomers. People think because they pay taxes, you know, maybe they own a rental house in Ledger, and so they think they can shuttle their children into the town. Um, the child actually has to sleep in Ledger and really be a resident of Ledger. I've had other people, you know, all of a sudden grandma is the caretaker, but they're driving the kid to grandma's house every morning, um, and the child's sleeping in Norwich. And so there's all sorts of things. We have one landlord who lived on the border, who um, their house, I should say, was on the Order of Ledger and Groton, um, who was giving the people the option of what school system to attend. And so they were using that as a rental kind of tool, and so we shut that down. There's just been a ton of work with that, um, but it's it's an ongoing effort, and it's and it's pretty challenging. And unfortunately, you know, people are trying to do the best for their children, and they want their their, their children in Ledger, um, and I have to kind of balance that with you know board policy and the expectations of the community. So it's. Uh, that's the only way I can say it, because I, I, you get to know the kids too, and so it's really painful when you're removing a child sure. and you got to sit in kindergarten class and read, read a book too much. Uh, that's part of the, the way the system works. Any other questions from council? Well, thank job. you very thank much. You. Anticipating our questions. Theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have the FAQ pa uh, page up, uh -huh. um, and we'll continue to do that. And we'll... Thank you. See you Great again job. as we move forward with the process. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Here it goes. Volume up. <laughs> okay, at this time I will um, ask any residents or property owners who wish to speak to come to the microphone, state your name and address, and your comments will be limited to three minutes. Who would like to go first? Yes. Hi, um, Robert Burnett, 61 Churchill Road. Um, and I would first like to uh, thank the council members for the very substantial amount of time and energy devoted to the short-term rental project and ordinance, considering all the pros and cons. Um, I think this ordinance has done a great job addressing the party house problem. I'm hoping that two years from now we no longer have a party house problems and let you move on to realizing the benefits of short-term rentals. The SCOG white paper states that there are benefits, primarily economic in nature, which can be obtained by communities. The Wharton School of Business notes that governments will derive substantial benefits for their economies and their communities. Over the next two years, Ledger might decide that these economic benefits are just really not worth the trouble of all this short-term rental stuff, maybe because there's still party house problems, etc. Or Ledger might actually want to promote and facilitate short-term rentals as something economically beneficial for the town as a whole. When with Ledger centrally located in the Mystic Coast and Country area, I believe there's a lot of potential. 
Uh, my question is to the council, um, two years from now, what would be the most efficient way for all parties concerned to present their concerns and solutions to the council? For example, could there be presentations or discussions to the land use committee or the admin committee, or perhaps this topic warrants its own STR commission, which could then pre present their opinions to the council. It would be new and unique, but uh, it might be where it's going. Um, uh, I think this would make it hopefully mm, less burdensome on the owners and also more effectively enforce, uh, uh, maybe more effectively able to enforce uh, you no know, party houses, et cetera. Um, and, you know, one example um, is that the current ordinance I'll have to transfer the ownership of one of my two properties over to my daughter, I guess, still figuring it out. And the gift tax, or the conveyance tax, or the account and the lawyer, all that money, it won't benefit me and it won't benefit the town either. So, you know, I don't know, maybe, I was wondering maybe it could be grandfathered in or something like that. Um, <coughs> but basically, that's my right. comments. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak before the council? Yes, sir. <coughs> Good evening. I'm uh, Steve Fagan, 63R Long Pond Road, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your, the time and energy that you spent in addressing <coughs> the uh, short-term rental. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. And I urge you to uh, approve it. Um, it's uh, a good step. It's not perfect, but I think it'll satisfy some of the concerns that some of the neighbors have had. And, uh, and again, I thank you for your time and effort, and I uh, hope you approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else at this time? Tim Lang, Four Butter Complain, Gross Ferry, Beretta Gross on the Bitter Sea Suite property. I wish we had more time to look at this. We only found it tonight at uh, 5 o'clock on the internet. Somebody put it up. Okay. But is, is this meeting going to decide whether this is final or what tonight? Yes. It is. I just have a question to you, sir. How much more time we've been talking about this for two years? Well, I would like to turn around and uh, just bring up some questions and present it to the council, okay? Uh, Bittersweet has uh, four bedrooms, yet uh, they have multiple beds in each room. They advertise sleeping 16. Uh, let's see. Why are there so many cars there? Okay. We don't have many this winter, but we've had a few, okay? It is rented on weekends, okay? They're all out of state. New York, etc. Okay. What is to stop the person from uh, renting and allow uh, them to bring in more people? Okay. We have a noise problem over there. It's not as bad in the winter time. Okay. But I'm sure it's going to pick right up in the summertime. We have trash. We have speeding. We have cars. We have uh, no regards for the neighborhood. It pulls down the value of the homes across from this property. This is an exceptional in comparison to other ones in town, okay? And uh, I don't think there was very much thought going into this regulation. Sir, we, ex well. we discussed that particular property at length at the public hearing. There were a number of the neighbors that came and spoke at that meeting. And so, in fact, it, that particular property was certainly considered when the regulation was written. Mayor, can I ask you, uh, do you have an update on what was done um, or how that's being handled? On what was done in terms of? On um, bittersweet. It's so, bittersweet, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the bittersweet one is being enforced by police action That's what I thought. because of parking and because of excessive noise um, and, and again this this ordinance will also speak to um, occupancy so that <laughs> one the, the house you spoke of actually at some point said sleeps 21 but um, that is not going to be the case mm -hmm. so I think it's a uh, it's two per bedroom type of thing mm -hmm. but in terms of um, prior to this ordinance <coughs> being in place 
um, it's police action that enforces a bulk of that and uh, they have been down there several times and again I'm, we're not going to get into a back and forth here but I do want you to understand that particular property was discussed at length at the public hearing I've got one question that house was a uh, 45 foot ranch three bedroom occupancy of family what have we done about the septic system there that would be an issue that would it be cannot, it cannot be adequate that, that would be a, a, a planning and zone, I'm not planning and zone, Alleged but light. a ledge light issue. And if you would, um, um, I mean, I, don't, I can't sit here now and say whether the septic has been expanded or whatever. You would have to check maybe with the building official or right. ledge light health district. But even, even in that case, if the septic system were to fail, and le understanding that Bittersweet is a newer subdivision, I'm sure those were all plotted with primary and reserve system capacity areas. So um, the onus at that point would be on the property owner so if he has to spend ten or twelve or fifteen thousand dollars to put in a new septic system, that is on him. Correct. And if the if in the meantime it means the house is shut down, like we recently did for a house and had the house shut down and not inhabitable for two years until a septic system was put in, that could also be the case. Well, we built in seventy two, okay. Proper size tank, etc. I don't think that house was there before us. Okay, mm. I'm sure it doesn't meet the requirements for the amount of activity it's having. Right. So, okay. under the this ordinance, if that's a three-bedroom house, under it was. this, and so it was this, so if so, the ordinance, the occupancy would be limited to two people per bedroom of twelve and older. So, it would not permit, you know, sixteen people renting the house, sixteen adults renting the house. It's advertised no. and because there's no. And I think right. you've seen the advertisement. We discussed it at length, and that's at why we need hearing. to pass the ordinance tonight. So you're you're saying we didn't give it much thought. Uh, may I respectfully ask, did you did you read the ordinance? I only glanced at it tonight before I came here. Okay, I'd encourage you to read it, read it thoroughly, because it's really that exact. <clears throat> kind of a situation is what we want to prevent and what we wrote the ordinance in to prevent. We didn't give it very little consideration. We gave in it we've given it two years worth of consideration with that exact kind of a situation in mind. Your neighbors did well. Mm -hmm. They were all here. Why was uh, you know you have the amount of people, adults in a bath a bedroom and such, okay. Why is it allowed to have more than a hundred children? Okay, we're more than a hundred That's never yeah, happened. The it's, it's I'm, I'm going to have to, um, okay, we, we can't get into a back and forth here. This is not a public hearing. Um, I will just tell you that I think if you read the ordinance, you may find yourself feeling much more comfortable about it. I don't think the ordinance had enough, has enough control, okay, over the part time. Okay, we appreciate your opinion. And um, we will have a two-year period. Well, let me just say this to, uh, to everybody. The nice thing about an ordinance compared to a change in the town charter is if you change the town charter, it may be years before you can correct something that you don't like. An ordinance, if in a month from now we find out, boy, this is, was, was a huge mistake, we can resend, we can change, we can start from scratch. There's a lot of things to do, and we'll all be watching it, and many of you will be watching it as well. So I think that's probably the, the best I can give to you right now. I'm sure I'm not going to be able to satisfy you, but we have um, two years, because I called today and asked, about two years of background, public comment, hours and hours of public comment, Many, many letters, many, um, many people spoke at subcommittees. It went through two subcommittees. Stop, stop. So I think um, nobody is going to be happy totally, but I think if you read the ordinance carefully, it should take care of the issues that you're concerned about. 
And at this point, I would ask if there's anybody else that would like to speak at this time. One more thing, please. Uh, I, you had a letter, ledger ordinance come out that said uh, airborne not allowed in ledger, okay? You don't even live up to that. What, 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 what are you talking about? Airborne. You've confused everyone on the council with that statement, sir. I think you've done a poor job protecting the taxpayer payers. Okay? I understand your opinion. No, I don't think you do because you don't. Oh, live, I do. You don't live to a, next to a situation like this. I wouldn't want to, but I can tell you that these people here have put tremendous effort into this. They have not taken it lightly. They have heard all of your neighbors. This is the last minute before. It's a zoning. It's a zoning. <coughs> oh. The one that issued by zoning that basically said that by zoning regulations they're not permitted, mm -hmm. but that. That had been changed by the Zoning Commission, and Mr. Uh, what he's not here, Mike, uh, but I'm not going to ask for comment. But that was also, <laughs> let me finish, sir. Go ahead. That was also determined later on after the discussion between the Zoning Commission staff and legal opinion that Airbnbs, because of the way that they are operated, fall outside of the zoning regulations. And that was also the same conclusion that came out of the Southeastern Council of Governments. So, but at the time when we first, when this first came up two years ago, that was a notice that was issued by the zoning enforcement officer saying that BNB, Airbnbs were not authorized and they could not get a zoning permit. That's all it says. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at this time? Hearing none, I would ask, are there any committee, commission, and board reports? Anybody? Comments of town councilors to my left. I have some comments, but I'd like to go last if anyone else is going to speak. Okay. To my right. Oh, no, I, I was getting my cheat sheet out. Okay. Um, the I just want to talk about the uh, census committee. We had an informational session last uh, Wednesday, and 13 people attended. 15 people filled out applications for jobs, and there's still. 10 more jobs needed um, to count the census in Ledger. And they're paying, I don't, in case you hadn't heard it last time, they're paying $23 an hour. That's pretty good for a part-time job. Um, and the census committee is planning consensus day at the libraries, and that would be sometime in April. And starting around March 12th, look for a letter <coughs> that'll go to every household from the census. So. Any other comments? Yes, Bill. Uh, this is something that um, I meant to uh, read to you earlier. Um, Ledyard High School's Lizzie Jancy um, was among the winners in the musical club of Hartford's annual high school performance competitions. Uh, the competition is held annually for Connecticut musicians in grades 9 to 12, for second and third place winners, and so on and so on. Jancy, a senior at Ledyard High School, plays first in the voice competition performing The Piper by John Duke and Mozart's Das Welken. Um, we have had the pleasure of hearing Lizzie in one of her performances down at uh, St. Luke's. She is a stunning performer. If you've ever seen her at the high school, um, she's been pleasing audiences and, and uh, wowing the kids since she, she was a freshman burst on the scene in one of the high school performances. Great performer, professionally trained, really proud of her and led good music. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> all right. Um, all right, so I, I wanted to address the, um, the political sign. And these are my comments. Our council chair will be sharing a statement that is co-written and endorsed by the group. But these are my own additional thoughts. Mayor Fred has shared details about the display of a political sign, later tagged with a spray-painted swastika, the symbol of the Nazi party. For so many reasons, it's despicable. During the Holocaust, Nazis targeted for extermination gypsies, Poles, 
the mentally and physically disabled, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, and especially Jews. In our present political context, the swastika has been co-opted as an anti-Trump symbol used to label the U.S. president a Nazi, tag Trump signs, and vandalize the property of people hosting them. This current trend provides critical context to the recent episode in Ledyard. I personally suspect this particular act was not meant to be anti-Semitic. Given the context, it seems more likely this message was meant to be anti-Trump. To be perfectly clear, either way, it is unacceptable. One person who initially expressed concern about the swastika later realized that in this case, it was probably anti-Trump. And this highlights the reason it's a really bad idea to let emotions get the best of us. How awful for our town's reputation to involve the news media, highlight the rotten behavior of a few bad actors, declare our town racist, and only then realize the leading narrative was wrong. Can we slow down at least long enough to gather evidence and context? I object to the accusation that anyone was trying to sweep the event under the rug. The point is that this episode was carried out by a couple of bad actors who do not represent the character of our community. Why give them a public platform? Why should the lousy behavior of a couple of people smear our collective reputation? If folks are genuinely concerned about hateful messaging, let's commit not to policing everyone else's speech, but our own. It feels good to scold and shake a self-righteous fist at others, but it is much more challenging to muster the humility and courage to look in the mirror. Of course there is hate in Ledyard. It's here because you and I live here. Hate is part of the human condition, and yes, we should counter it. But hate isn't out there somewhere vague. It is personal, and it looks like something. Sometimes it's obvious, like spray painting a swastika. Sometimes it's less brazen, like recklessly calling one's opponent a nasty name instead of presenting a cogent argument. It's in judging another's motives, accusing them of the worst, <coughs> while excusing ourselves from the hassle of understanding their perspective. It's dripping from the condescending tone used to let that person know they are unworthy of courtesy or respect. It's the string of dehumanizing insults that many these days mistake for wit. Of course, there's lots of love in Ledyard too. It's here because you and I live here. Love is also part of the human condition, and yes, we should promote it. Love isn't out there somewhere vague. It's personal, and it looks like something. It looks like the people who volunteer to coach our kids' sports teams, the donors and volunteers who help feed our hungry neighbors and who make sure the kids have proper seasonal clothing, shoes, and coats, the churches that joined forces to help neighbors in financial crisis. A little girl who presented cupcakes to leaders all over town just to spread some cheer. Residents, young and old, who pick up trash and nip bottles by the thousands off the sides of our roads. The folks who donated and planted hundreds and hundreds of daffodil bulbs to beautify our town. They will bloom in mere weeks. Look for them. Love looks like the prayers prayed, the meals made, and the encouraging words offered to lift others. This is the overwhelming character of our community. Maybe somebody should call the news. Two quick shout outs and then I will stop. First, thank you to Linda Davis for actively shutting down nastiness by disallowing vulgarity and insults on the Ledyard Community Forum. Few people actually stand up to it the way she does on a regular basis. Ironically, she is despised by some for this very reason. Second, 
Thank you to Bill Psalms for setting an example by going out to coffee with an ideological challenger. In his own words, he responded to something I put on Facebook. He wrote, planned coffee next month with a new friend. A, we can argue publicly on Facebook, or B, sit down and really understand each other in person. I like B, he said. Thank you. Our town has a better story to tell. I hope those who are concerned are sincerely concerned enough to pause in the mirror, then take an opponent out for coffee and rehumanize them eye to eye, heart to heart, voice to voice. That's my two and a half cents. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? So um, last week I uh, sent an email to all town councilors asking them for input uh, for a public statement and I did receive comments from most of them. I took them all and um, worked them into a uh, comment or a statement. Um, I think each of you that commented, which was most of you, will find a little bit of your uh, comments uh, woven into this statement. The Ledger Town Council strongly condemns the use of the swastika and any racist symbols as hateful actions. Regardless of their intent, these symbols are unacceptable to each of us. Additionally, we recognize an individual's protected right of free speech and decry the desecration of anyone's property or beliefs. The Ledger Town Council stands together in denouncing any racist attacks and encourages immediate reporting of such actions to the ledgered police. Advancing these actions on social media only serves to widely promote a hateful message and could also hinder proper investigation of these actions. Understanding there is work to be done in every community, the Ledger Town Council encourage all of its citizens to reflect on the lessons of, lessons of history and to engage in respectful dialogue with each other rather than rhetoric, anger, and further promulgation of such destructive and divisive acts, which are an affront to all of us. And that is a statement from the Legend Town Council, and I will ask that um, to be added to the record. Okay, at this time, review and approval of minutes. I'll accept a, um, yeah, um, Make a <laughs> <laughs> the word motion was slipping from me. Um, Kevin, yes, please. Second. Motion's been made and seconded for both meetings, for both meetings a public hearing and regular meeting minutes of February 12th. Roxanne, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Um, I received some communications on the Tri Town Trail, which I'm not sure you have yet, Roxanne. I will forward them to you as well as uh, refer it to the Land Use uh, Committee. Okay, Council Subcommittee Liaison Reports. Admin. Admin did not meet tonight. The STR is obviously on the agenda later. And I think that's it. Okay. Finance. We have a couple of appointments. But yeah. Yeah. Finance. Finance met tonight just before this meeting and all three items are on the agenda. We're continuing to look. We just got um, feedback from the Board of Ed on the resolution for the multi-use track and field facility. So we'll be working on that at our next meeting. And would you remind everybody that might be listening when the uh, workshops are? Yes. Uh, Finance Committee meets three times Three afternoons, March 5th, March 12th, and March 9th, 9th and March 12th. Thank you. I, obviously, I'm clear on where I'm meeting. <laughs> um, so what we'll be doing this year, as we do every year, is we will go through the town's budget line by line for every expense, for every department, as well as the capital improvement program, and then the Board of Ed budget. Uh, the Board of Ed budget will be going over later, but in these three afternoons, we meet with the department heads for every department in the town, ask questions about their proposed budget, what they're asking for. We look at what they've spent year to date. We look back five years at what they've spent for a trend of spending. 
um, and then we look for uh, and discuss ways that we might further reduce the budget or if they've made some extra requests, maybe help them out with, with uh, special needs. That process then takes us to a public hearing um, where the town council has approved the final budget that the town council finance and the, and the town council have put together. We present that at a public hearing on April 27th. And there we take public comment. We go back, we work on the budget again, and we present it for a final meeting in May and the May 18th. May 18th, followed by a referendum vote the following day, which is a Tuesday, uh, the polls will be open for the residents to vote on the budget. Is that the same thing? Thank you, Bill. No, I just want to add, uh, so the workshop's open to the public, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So this would yeah. be a great time if somebody uh, really wants to know how the budget process works, because usually at the end, when we're getting ready to vote, like tonight, somebody comes up and says, you know, I didn't know whatever. So these are open meetings. They're in the middle of the day. You can come here. You can go over the same information that we have to to do the budget with regard to revenues, expenditures, budget requests, so on. And that would be a really great time for anybody in the public here to get engaged in the process instead of showing up on the day of the vote and say, well, I didn't know. Please come. We will welcome you. There's coffee in the back. We usually have some food on the table. We'd love to hear your input. That we pay for. <laughs> <laughs> and when we, when we say we, it's not the town. I, I would just add, though, that being said, um, we recognize that during the day is not a time that many members of the public or residents right. can attend, but the reason we do it during the day is because we are meeting with department heads, we're meeting with town employees, and so we do it um, during that part of the day. So, okay, any questions? Was that it for finance? Mm -hmm. Okay, land juice? We have not met, I have nothing to report. Okay, and let's see, liaison reports. Anyone? I have two. Go ahead. Um, historic District met uh, Monday night. That's the Historic District Commission. Um, they've been receiving donations both at the Lester House and at the Ledger Updown Sawmill, and they continue to come in, um, which is nice. Their budget expenditures are on track. Um, unfortunately, Commissioner Jim Sweet is moving to Maine. He is the chair of the Updown Sawmill Committee, does a wonderful job, and will be sorely missed um, by the commission anyone who's been to the sawmill. Um, the Nathan Lester House Committee is rethinking Lester House driveway access to allow overflow parking in the lower field to enter and exit the lower field from the lower end of the driveway. So as you come into the property, it's a one-way road, you turn right, there's a parking lot if that's full, you go down the hill, there's an exit driveway, and it gets really confusing at that point of what to do because you just missed your turn to get into the field. So they're thinking about making a turn through a gap in the wall just before you leave the property so you can go in and out of the field for the overflow parking and it will, I think, really solve a lot of problems. Um, Nathan Lester House hours were extended into October this year and that brought a lot more traffic to the property and 95% of their visits occur on the weekends. Very few occur on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So rather than uh, continue with Tuesday and Thursdays, they're going to make it a practice to stay open into October because it's a nicer time of year, it's cooler, more people come out mm -hmm. on the weekends, and they will not be open on Tuesday and Thursdays, but anybody who wants to get a tour can always make one by appointment at any time. Um, and a new white oak door made by Vin Godino was hung on the woodshed at the Lester House. <laughs> that's, that's my report on the historic district. Any other liaison reports? I got one more. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, WPCA met last night. Um, Xylem Controls is still fighting with Fuss and O'Neill over the work they didn't do and wanting to get paid for. Um, the WPCA received three bids to complete the abandonment of the Loftus Well Field, which was, we stopped using that 10 years ago, but DPH requires that it be officially abandoned. So they voted the award to the lowest bidder. They did get three three bids, and it's going to cost seventy one hundred dollars. 
Um, they're continuing to review their water and sewer budgets. Actually, they, they passed them on to the town council. Um, but in the process, Groton Utilities has notified the WPCA that it has applied for a rate increase in October 20 and 21. So the WPCA has put their budget together, but now they're, they, they have an idea of what the, what the increase will be. It's four to five percent. But since it doesn't take place until October 20, the actual net amount in the budget is going to be about one and a half percent difference. So they're going to submit, they approve the budget as is. And uh, we're seeking further, further uh, advice on how to manage that. Um, the bottom line is it's, it's about a $4,000 difference in their budget. Um, and they also voted to request that, that and we'll be seeing this soon, uh, to request the town council approve a $15,000 capital expenditure for a Ledyard Center sewer feasibility updating, feasibility study that updates previous studies. Uh, and that's to accommodate new private development at 740 Colonel Ledyard Highway in 26 Iron Street, meaning the former Ledyard Center School. That's my report. Thank you. Any questions? Any other reports? We have two quick. Um, um, Andre alluded to this, but as you know, the beautification committee planted 2,000 bulbs, um, which we would have expected to come up during normal um, time of bulbs, and some of them are beginning to peek out. Um, I was going to do this contest of, for people to take photos, but I was waiting until, you know, at least another month from now, but I may have to start it early, so watch for those little guys. It's about four inches. Are they? Definitely. Oh, anyway, best laid plans. And then the, uh, the um, Report of the Winter Farmers Market uh, last week was the last market, very well attended. Uh, the whole season has been well attended, significantly better than a year ago. Um, lots of excitement, and we have put out our applications for the summer market. Those are beginning to come in, and most popular is food trucks. Food trucks are really interested in the Ledger Farmers Market because the word is out that Ledger really likes to eat a lot. <laughs> and so we are a really popular market. Uh, so it will have some good things for you on uh, June 3rd is opening day. Report of the mayor. Yes. So um, let me just start by saying that the bottle bill uh, presentation was supported by the Council of Governments as part of their uh, legislative agenda mm. this year. I too support it. Um, I remember picking up cans on the side of the street for money when I was a kid and I'm almost 50 and it's still a nickel. So uh, I think there's time, it's time to move that number a little bit. Um, Oregon was the most recent state to change it, which they did on April 1st of 2017 from a nickel to a dime and it increased the, uh, the re returns from 45% to over 80%. So the redemption rate, you know, <laughs> came close to doubling. So it's a, it's a huge impact. And if somebody doesn't want to, if somebody doesn't mind paying it at the store and they don't mind throwing it out the window, chances are somebody's gonna pick it up and take it back for uh, a refund. So um, I support that and I hope that they will make the change this year. It will help uh, clean up our streets. Um, Councillor Sibilia mentioned uh, the police recruiting. I just wanted to let you know too that uh, when we put recruits through the academy, there's essentially like a two-year protection clause on those recruits. So if another municipality, now that doesn't speak to the state, but if another municipality decides we had a really great recruit and they want them and they lure them away from us, they have to pay us. So it doesn't necessarily help us because we then have to put a new recruit into the academy and go through the process again, but it doesn't leave us holding the bag after we've just paid to send somebody through the academy. Uh, I was appointed to the uh, Southeastern Connecticut Housing Authority um, Alliance, I should say, uh, this week by the Council of Government. So uh, not a huge lift. They, they meet quarterly, but it'll be an interesting uh, group to take part in. Also attended the uh, Housing Alliance workshop on February 19th. That was down at the United uh, That discussed affordable housing in various uh, communities around the state, the entire state, as to how they address afford uh, affordable housing options. Uh, there, was, there was one that was um, particularly interesting, which they actually, 
what they do is this this nonprofit purchases a, a derelict type home they fix it up they separate the house from the land the nonprofit retains the land and then sells the house fairly inexpensively to somebody that can afford it um, a little bit of a concern on that depending on how big that gets is that uh, an average house lot for the town of Ledger for um, some of the more uh, affordable neighborhoods like Christie Hill or the Highlands in Ledger that would mean a loss of twelve to thirteen hundred dollars a year for the tax bill which is for the underlying land doesn't amount to a whole lot for a couple but let's say you've got a hundred or two hundred of them in the town so it's something that um, affordable housing needs to be addressed it's just a matter of how is it addressed so I will uh, I'll be attending those meetings and working closely with them uh, we also received from Tegan Bond uh, the 2019 municipal water and sewer rate studies I will share the entire studies um, to Roxanne so that you can review it and I've also graphed each of the municipalities and their rates so that you can see as it's graphed out where um, Ledger's uh, supplies come from so in the case of WPCA for water or squaw um, or Groton Utilities you will see those rates on there and I think it's um, fairly interesting uh, the 2019 grand list was released it increased by 0.47 percent um, so it is an uptick I will tell you that the top 10 are Eversource, Mashantucket, Pequot Tribal Nation, Fox Run, Trinzio Yankee Gas, CVS and Gales Ferry, Ocean State Job Lot, Ledger Meadows, which is the 32 units at the foot of the hill over here, uh, across from Ledger Village, uh, Stonegate Village, and you store it. Um, it's about $81.5 million. But to put it into perspective, um, I wanted to look at other towns. So, number, it, well, first back to our town. The two through eight taxpayers for us equal what the number two taxpayer is for us. I mean, I'm sorry, three through eight. So if you add all those up, add up everybody behind number one and two, it only equals number two. Um, our top five is about half of what Stonington's top five are. And the shocking one is that if you put together our entire top 10 on our grand list, it's 42% of just the top taxpayer in Greenwich. So. It's just amazing to see the numbers. But uh, just a little perspective. Um, the town green update, I don't know if you've been by and you've seen mounds of beautiful dark black soil. Um, that is the, the uh, resurfacing. They've already put in the underground conduits to t uh, carry power to different uh, buildings. Uh, the power that was there was uh, truly not safe. It was not um, weatherproof. It wasn't made for, for wet environments, but it was, uh, the panels were outdoors and exposed, so that had to be upgraded. Uh, so we put them underground instead of having poles all over the town green. And they are in the process, because this is a snowless winter, they're in the process of spreading topsoil right now. So we will um, keep our fingers crossed that the winter stays the way it is. And who knows, we might be growing grass in two weeks. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the budget from the Board of Ed was received on time and I will deliver the budget Monday afternoon to the town clerk at which point uh, it will be your budget so uh, we will be ready for that and then my last piece is that uh, hopefully you all received a, an invitation for an EDC workshop from Connecticut Advance which used to be the Connecticut Economic Resource Center um, that is something that's paid for uh, by Eversource. Eversource puts money into a fund for, for these professionals to come to every municipality in the state of Connecticut. And you may have heard me say before, I don't want to be the last municipality in the state of Connecticut to get this benefit. So uh, we jumped on it this year and um, that is happening on March 19th from 5.30 to 7.30 in this room. So um, if you can, please RSVP for us so that we know that you will be coming and we value your input on it. and. Uh, it's kind of uh, an idea as to what do we envision Ledger economically and how do we get there. So the input is, it will be appreciated. And I know, Andre, you had indicated you will be there, though a little bit late, and that's okay. I appreciate that. So um, look forward to it. And that is my report for tonight. Are there any questions for the mayor? No questions, mayor. 
Okay, Thank we you. have no old business. Would anybody like to amend the agenda under new business? Hearing none, I will turn this over to admin for a whole lot of items. <laughs> okay. I move that we adopt a proposed ordinance regulating short-term rentals in the town of Ledyard as contained in the draft dated February 10th, 2020. Second. So. <coughs> Motions made by and seconded on discussion. Would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we've, we have been discussing this for two years. It's the desire, desire of some property owners to rent their residential homes on a short-term basis. And so the council worked with um, land use to draft the ordinance. It came through admin. Our goal is, first of all, to allow it. Um, there are communities everywhere banning it. And after walking through this process, I understand why they're banning it. But we don't want to do that. We, we, we just fundamentally don't want to do that. But we do want to prevent the party house situation. And we do want to prevent um, commercial entities from coming in, buying up residential properties, and turning them into primarily commercial endeavors in residential zones. That's what we try to. That's what we um, have attempted with this ordinance. I think it's. I think it's good, and it has a two-year sunset clause. We expect to learn some things, but I'm. I'm in favor of it, and. I would really love to see this thing get voted up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments? Yes. So, um, like the gentleman who stood up here before, uh, I've been contacted <laughs> by at least six or eight people, constituents, which, as you as you all know, that's a lot, you know, for any one particular ordinance. <laughs> To, for people to be concerned with as a representative sample uh, and the biggest concern is the party house mm -hmm. issue so um, the only the only reservation I would have is to make sure that when the police are called they show up and they issue a summons you know that and that obviously direction has to come down from the mayor you know to, to make sure that you know if we pass the ordinance it's enforced and enforced with legitimacy not just well they go knock on the door and say hey quiet it down you know because this, these are residential neighborhoods mm -hmm. there are children in the adjoining <coughs> apartment or houses mm -hmm. uh, or down the road and people who just like the gentleman here tonight probably just wants to enjoy his home in peace and quiet mm -hmm. Absolutely. like most of us, right like all of us do yeah. um so with that said yeah. I, I just tell you i'm in favor of it yeah. Yeah. you know like most legislation it's you're going after the couple of people who ruined it for everybody. These have been operating quietly and well for a long time. And then a couple of people come along and they just blow it. And so here we are. I'll agree that this may not be the most perfect document. We put enough time into it with no stretch of the imagination. But I think the biggest part about this document is that it gives the ability, it's a, it's a two year document right now. Mm -hmm. It gives the ability for us to come back, revisit, ability for those people who conform to this to the process to have input valuable input nothing prevents somebody six months from now a year from now saying hey to the town saying something to the town council saying hey I'm an owner of a short term or I live next to a short term here's what I see has worked out well so far what hasn't worked out well have the cops police officers been supportive in the process it gives a chance to kind of work that out and get a better product two years out if that's what we need to do so I, I think what we have is it's not the perfect product but it's a good product mm -hmm. I would like to thank um, those of you out there who <coughs> contributed to the um, a lot to parts of the um, ordinance and also I look at it as it's only for two years let's get it out there let's try it let's see what works and what doesn't work and then we can revisit it again thank you any other comments yes yeah. So, uh, as Andra said, uh, I'll say it a little differently. Nobody that I know likes laws and regulations, but every law and regulation that I can think of came up because somebody abused a privilege. And that's why we have laws, that's why we have regulations. Um, I think the party house has gotten a lot of attention, but I think there are some other aspects as well. 
And one is, why regulate me? I'm not doing anything harmful. I'm not causing any problems. Take care of the party house and the other ones like it, but I didn't do this, I didn't cause it. So to the people who own properties have been doing this, I feel for you. But the fact is, we also have to regulate for health and human safety. Um, if you have a person living in your house and has rented for a short term, they've never been there before, and your house catches fire, the town could be liable along with you, and more importantly, who wants to see somebody lose their life in a fire in a, in a house that is not protected for people who have never been there before and wake up in the middle of the night with a fire? Similarly, we have to worry about pollution in streams and lakes and ponds. We also have to be fair to other businesses in town. So we have hotels, we have bed and breakfasts, and we have country inns. They are all regulated heavily. It's not fair for other commercial entity, entities in the same business not to be regulated. So I'm in favor of this. I'm in favor of regulating hosted as well as non-hosted. And I agree with all the comments about if it's not perfect, we have the opportunity to get it there. But we've got to do something. And if we don't do something, then we just have to make them illegal. Right. And I don't, th mm -hmm. I don't think that's fair. Right. Any other comments? I would just add that um, you know, it would be nice if we everybody could get the document, we all sit here and circle something we don't like, except the things we circle would be different. Every person <laughs> would dislike something different. So that's how we end up with what we have, and um, we will continue to monitor, and um, again, the enforcement is, is key, really is key in this mm -hmm. particular yeah, document. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Roxanne, would you call the roll? Mr. Soms. Yes. Mr. Washington. <coughs> yes. Mrs. Davis. Yes. Mr. Dombrowski. Yes. Mrs. Ingalls. Yes. Mr. Malone. Yes. Mr. Marshall. Yes. Mrs. McGratton. Yes. Mr. Sebelia. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Now we have a um, whole lot of um, appointments. It's nice mm -hmm. to see people step up. Mm -hmm. We thank them. And uh, I'll let you mm -hmm. take them from there. Take it from here. I move that we appoint Mr. Glenn Grabner, D, 42 Eagle Ridge Drive, Gales Ferry, as an alternate member to the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Commission to complete a two-year term ending October 31st, 2020, filling a vacancy left by Ms. Jancy. Second. Any uh, discussion? Anyone? You know, I just want to I just want to explain to for the sake of anybody who's watching. You know, our residents apply for these open positions. They get the endorsement of their party. They're, you, you know, somebody vouches for them, even if I personally don't know them. Somebody's vouching for them. They want to volunteer in these positions. Um, you know, they have to fill out an application. So I, I'm just grateful for people who, who want to give something of their skill set to, to uh, these commissions. Well said. Yeah. Thank you. Roxanne, would you call the roll? Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Sons? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion <coughs> carries. Next. I move that we appoint Ms. Meredith Robinson, D, Four Maid Marion Drive, Gales Ferry, to the Parks and Recreation Commission to complete a three year term ending December 29th, 2022, filling a vacancy left by Mr. Davies. Second. Second. Uh, unless there's any comments, Roxanne, call the roll. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next item. Okay. Now this one actually does deserve a comment because I'm not sure how it went out on the agenda. The committee uh, admin um, voted to recommend that we appoint Ms. Gray to the Senior Citizens Commission. She has since withdrawn her application. Um, and, and we had a rare occurrence that we actually had three people apply for two positions. I, I don't recall that ever happening before, so we had to choose. And we, we simply chose 
Um, one of those three people was already serving on another commission, so we just thought, okay, we'll leave them there and we'll take two new people. Um, so no slight to Ms. Shulman, who we are now going to appoint. <laughs> it was simply a matter of, of having to pick. So um, I make a motion to appoint Ms. Cheryl Shulman, D61 Inchcliffe Drive, Gales Ferry, to the Senior Citizens <coughs> Commission for a complete two-year term ending December 9th, 2021, filling a vacancy left by Mr. Holmes. Second. I Motion's made and you. seconded. Proxy, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next item. I move to appoint Ms. Paula Crocker, U, 1500 Route 12, Gales Ferry, to the Senior Citizens Commission for a com complete... A to complete a two-year term ending December 9th, 2021, filling a vacancy left by Ms. Rodriguez. Second. Motion's made, but seconded. Uh, Roxanne, would you call the and, roll? And oh, I'd like I'm to sorry. thank Ms. Rodriguez. I see she's sitting here, oh, yeah. so thank her for her service. Thank you. She didn't quit. She got elected to the Board of Ed, so <laughs> she couldn't continue to serve. So and thank you for that. <laughs> for quitting? No. No, no, no she's the Board of Ed. Um... Roxanne, would you call the roll? Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next item. Uh, what do you have for your next item? I have Mrs. Ms. Margaret Boyd, but I'm looking on paper. Can That's I read it off I of have. yours? Because mine does not, the motion is not written. <laughs> oh, sorry. Here. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I move that we appoint Ms. Margaret Boyd, R257 Wailhead Road, Gales Ferry, to the Housing Authority to complete a five year term ending March 31st, 2023, filling a vacancy left by Ms. Constantine. Second. Thank you. And Ms. Boyd will fulfill the role of secretary. Yes. They're because waiting. because <laughs> Charlie um, insists that every member of the commission serves as an officer because they have a small yeah. committee Nine and five. she has agreed to serve as secretary so they're real happy and anxious for this one so <laughs> thank Ms. Boyd for stepping up any other comments Roxanne would you call the roll Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Sons? <coughs> yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next item. I move to appoint Mr. William Thorne, R3 Audio Slain, Ledyard to the Farmers Market Committee to complete a three year term ending February 26, 2023. Oh, no. Second. It's just a subject. And if you remember, we increased the committee from seven to nine members, and we have two members, two new members this evening, which will bring us up to eight members. Bill's going to be great. Yeah, he will be. Roxanne, would you call that? I didn't. Hmm? Second, who seconded? Did you see Bill for John? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next. I move to appoint Mr. Peter Harry, D973 Shoeville Road, Ledger to the Farmers Market Committee to complete a three year term ending February 26, 2023. So moved. And again, he will He's bring. He's also going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to laugh. Those are going to be fun for sure. Yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but he also has a lot of um, marketing um, background and uh, a creative talent, which I think will be um, uh, used uh, as far as the committee. So we thank, well, we thank everybody for volunteering. Roxanne, would you call the roll? Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next item. 
I move to set a public hearing date to be held on March 25th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. in the Council Chambers, Annex Building, 741 Colonel Ledyard Highway to receive comments and recommendations regarding proposed amendments to Ordinance Number 300-029, formerly Number 34, an ordinance Excuse me, an ordinance regarding control of alcoholic beverages at Town of Ledyard facilities as contained in the draft dated February 3rd, 2020. Second. Second. Um, discussion. This is just, just to, to set, set the, the public, public hearing. hearing. We've been discussing this one for quite a while. Well, Roxanne, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. I will move to finance. I move to adopt a proposed fair housing resolution for the town of Ledyard as contained in the draft dated February 10, 2020. Second. This is something we do every year. It's to support um, grant applications and it's merely a, a routine. We have to do it every year. We don't get the grants. Any other discussion? Roxy, roll, Mr. Please. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. I move to approve one tax refund in the amount of $3,480.06 that ex exceeds the $2,400 limit in accordance with tax collector departmental procedures. Second. <clears throat> so we get quite a few of these people accidentally pay their taxes twice or the mortgage company pays it and they pay it and usually the tax collector catches it and the mayor signs off on anything under 2400 it used to be 1200 we had to raise it um, this person paid their their mortgage twice or their, their taxes twice so everything's in order Roxanne, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next item? Um, let's see, moving to land use. I make a motion to adopt the proposed amendments to ordinance number 400 tax 007, formerly 146. An ordinance regarding waste management and recycling in the town of Ledger as contained in the draft dated October 16, 2019. Second. So this is simply updating the ordinance to talk about the, uh, our work with SCARA, who is the, we're doing our waste uh, disposal is now going to be at the wheel operator in Lisbon, not in the present incinerator. So it just updates that language. I believe I read something in there about uh, we're going to continue to send recyclables to romantic waste, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. And we're going to pay, I think I saw $70 a ton to get rid of them. Is that from 55? Yeah. Well, no, we used to, Start receive, money. Yeah. We yeah. Used to receive money. So. Starting in 2021. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So we used to receive $40 a ton, and then we were kind of net zero, right. and now we're at we're paying seventy. We're paying more than we are paying tipping mm -hmm. fees for the trash. Right. So the market is changing faster than we can adapt. Right. So this is a question we receive a lot, and it would be really nice if we wrote out a FAQ on this, yeah. so that when it's asked, any one of us can either type or respond to mm -hmm. someone or from a phone call exactly those what the scenario is, because yeah. I think. A lot of people really don't understand. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's um, well, prob Steve is probably good to put something like that together. Yeah. yeah. That would be really good. Because he he works as as you know yeah. he's he's on the SCARA board, yeah. right. mm -hmm. and he works closely with this aspect of it. So, so I want to make sure I understand it correctly. But if I if what I just said is true, and it's cheaper to throw it away, throw it away than to recycle mm -hmm. it. Um, that's really going to change the way we do. We're going to have to change the way we do business. Correct. We're going to have to start to separate again. I think. Is so. Single streams. Um, yeah. yeah. I was just about to ask because yeah. you look at the going from the state where we were getting money, we were getting money yeah. to take it, mm -hmm. but that yeah. was not single stream. That was everything was separated. Right. 
but then they well, were getting even, a, even when we went to single stream we were getting mm -hmm. fixed forty dollars mm -hmm. a ton for mm -hmm. recycles wow yeah because mm -hmm. just just look at single stream and how messy that can be right you know you go by and see people's trash and you there's know, the, even a lot of waste yeah. in single stream a lot of right. things go in there yeah. that really aren't recycled that's what, that's what i'm saying we see all the photos yeah. in the past yeah. where they've got all kinds of stuff yeah. in there right. Right. that's driving cars what changed was china used to take it all yes they don't and want now it. they generate yeah. recyclables so they're really right. picky about what they take so yeah. the market yeah. just Evaporated. Yes. We checked it if it's yeah. at, at all contaminated. Well, that was yeah. the other part. Right. A lot of stuff that was being sent over was not recyclable. Yeah. Recyclable right. and garbage. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Then they, but people are not cleaning the bottles. They're not washing yeah. it, and they're actually throwing away things into the recycling that are not recyclable, right. mm -hmm. including food waste. Yeah. The, so, uh, so it would be nice yeah. to have some sort of a white paper on that. I mean, not long, yeah. just a, a one pager, yeah. because it is. Um, Bullets got to be bullets. Yeah, it's a whole change in the yeah. mm -hmm. way people think. Yeah. If Scara did one a while ago, uh, you, you may hear the term wish cycle instead yep. of recycle. Mm -hmm. People would throw a garden hose in there thinking, well, it's plastic, it's rubber, it's got to be recyclable. They're hoping it is. It's not. Right. Um, there's a lot of things that go in there. Uh, electrical wire that's stripped out of a house if somebody's doing a remodel or something. Can it be recycled in a way? Yes, but not through our single stream system mm. so yeah that's that there are things i i will uh i will yeah. provide that to steve so you can work you. on maybe that. some tips for what people could do to like i know that mm. one of the i forget where i got it and i have it home comes up on the refrigerator here's what you can recycle oh, right yeah, yeah. 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 well i mean yeah. other things it's like, like you, if you kitchen. compost right. you know yeah. you're taking a huge amount of weight mm. out of the trash yeah, exactly. if, if you want to recycle metal take it to the town landfill if you're willing yeah. to do it right. yeah. so copper wire yeah. I'm pretty sure you can take that. And Absolutely. Them, right? yeah. I mean, we have we have the the roll off dumpsters at the transfer station yeah. that get filled routinely with scrap metal, yeah. and then the town derives value from that as opposed to trying to put it into a cart and then it gets rejected. Yeah. If it's scrap metal, you put it near the curb. Yes. I had a dishwasher. <laughs> put it near the curb. <laughs> so I went to McDonald's when my kid came back. It was gone. <laughs> the door was off. It was garbage out. You know, but people are going to pick this stuff up. So. And the other part is, as people are throwing stuff in the trash, you get two pickups a year at bulky waste. Mm -hmm. And if you just wait six months, take whatever you got, put it on the curb, call them. We're paying for it already. Yeah. yeah. We <laughs> love talking trash. <laughs> <laughs> trash is a good thing. Yes, we do. Okay, and on that note, Roxanne, what you call the roll? Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Sons? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Next item. I make a motion to adopt the proposed amendments to ordinance number 300, tax 027, <coughs> formerly number 152. In order to regulating parking and other activities in town roads and right of ways and providing penalties for the violation thereof. Yeah. Second. So this update to this ordinance, um, <coughs> we added in the provision that you can't throw leaves into the town right away. Mm. Uh, we would have thought that would have been, no, people would have thought that it wasn't there, so. It was, now it, now it, it was like, vague. It was vague, well, so we clarified that. It's popular in New Jersey. Because they, they come by with a big vacuum. And just mm. Well, we used to do that. Many, many of you are too young to remember, but we used to va vacuum um, leaves. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, people blowing the leaves and the leaves is not permitted. So this ordinance is sort of near and dear to my heart because I'm the one that sort of posts it when we have um, um, things that come up as far as snow and moving snow in the right of way and cars in the right of way. And every time I do it, I get laughed at. And the reason I get laughed at is because they don't feel it's enforced. Mm. So this is another one we really have to, if we're going to pass an ordinance, we have to have the enforcement piece that you brought up with the other ordinance. You know, the last time, I know what the ordinance says about parking from like December to yes. April. I got a letter. Well, that's from the good. police department. That's good. that's good. Because my my son parked outside for like a week, mm -hmm. and we got a letter saying, "Hey, you can't do that." Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they were courteous enough to give us uh, courteous yes. enough to give yes. us a letter. Yes. And not a summons. Yes. I, 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 I personally appreciate because you know 
I'm paying the bills. There's no warrant <laughs> out there. Well, I, I, I'm glad to hear that. So <laughs> well, it's just, a just, law, a law just so you know from the enforcement perspective, this year we were actually planning on towing cars. So for winter storms, we were planning on towing cars that weren't removed. Uh -huh. We haven't had any snow to have to deal with. <laughs> well, I appreciate. So the enforcement it. was ready. Yes. Okay. Had to have the, I know. Didn't have to snow. Wait, to wait, anybody, right? wait till April. <laughs> Stop it. Yeah, that's when we're going to get our snow, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Roxanne, would you call the roll? Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mrs. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. McGratton? Yes. Mr. Sebelia? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Washington? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion carries. Uh, just one other item. We have a um, town council photo. And poor Mr. Washington manages to miss our photo. <laughs> and Steve Michael, well, not that he misses it, he's not there for photo day because he's not on the council. So, like, for what, this two, two years you weren't in the photo? <laughs> So what we would like to do, assuming next meeting everybody is going to be here, Roxanne will send out a little notice just saying... Wear your Sunday best. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So we'll, we'll try to do that at the next meeting. Good. Okay, so that's we can good. have a new official photo. Uh, especially now since everybody goes to the website and there we all are, right there. So, I noticed that. Exactly. Right. That's right. Terms of what you're viewing and all. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. This meeting is adjourned.